Modern Melbourne is a series of interviews that document the extraordinary lives and careers of some of our most important architects and designers. Today we speak with Daryl Jackson, AO. After completing his education at RMIT and University of Melbourne, Daryl went on to establish his practice with Evan Walker in 1965. His early work in brutalism cemented his reputation as one of Australia's leading architects and his considerable teaching, writing and lecturing has had a significant influence on the course of Australia's architectural identity. Let's start at the beginning. Can you tell me about how your early family life influenced your decision to become an architect? Well, I was very keen to, to draw and paint. My mother was a seamstress, a milliner, and I had an uncle as well who was a, a builder. And so my older brother and myself travelled around um, in holiday time doing alts and additions to um, houses in Mooney Ponds and Ascot Vale. And then I felt that I wanted to make things myself and uh, so, f so far went to RMIT. And did your parents encourage you into architecture when you started oh, drawing? It was, was my decision and I think they were both happy, my father and my mother. Uh, and so my brother wanted to be a builder, older than me, and so I um, took up architecture. Were there any seminal experiences during your studies at RMIT and then later at University of Melbourne that, that changed your approach to design? To design um, is really a, th a thinking mechanism and in terms of making things and fabricating things you need to know what it is that, that you're doing. And so we were making in RMIT going ahead with uh, models and so on and so we could see three dimensional models uh, and then take them home and my mother would think well. Wow, and were there visiting international professors? I think in a conversation earlier you mentioned Walter Gropius came to Melbourne and that had a big impact on, on your, your ideas around architecture. Yeah, the, the studios in RMIT were really expansive and their interior design people, other sculpt, sculpture and, and then hands-on craftsmanship in the carpentry shop. So, there was plenty of room to see in, in how you could manufacture things mm -hmm. as well as design things. And so uh, in 1954, Walter Gropius, uh, the king of modernism, came, came to Melbourne and uh, he met with Robin Boyd and so they came to our um, RMIT studios and gave, and gave a lecture. And how did that impact on you as a young student? I think I was overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these were the black, black and white era. Uh, so my mates there, if there was a spare time, we'd uh, look at the universal one hour shows down Swanson Street, just to get a, get a flavour of what else there is in the world. At a, so at a time where Melbourne was quite old fashioned still, yes. here comes Walter Gropius and kind of blows your mind. It does. We had the benefit of the, the, the library and museum at that time. Mm -hmm. And so we would wonder if there was a spare period wandering around the museum and, and, and looking at, uh, um, I suppose, the library as well, and looking in the arts books as well and the architecture books. We had two or three very good uh, mentors for us in terms of Kevin Borland and uh, Peter McIntyre. And at that time, it was 1954, um, we were, they were um, to build the 1956 Olympic swimming pool, which they'd won in a competition. So we would troop down there and see how it was being made in the round. So you went from RMIT to, to University of Melbourne. Can you talk about the differences between the two schools of architecture at the time? The, the schools, I think, were not dissimilar. And so you did the first three years, um, and we did architectural history, painting, drawing, and so on. And we came 
I think further with that um, time dealing with um, painting and so on going and then in fourth year and fifth year at Melbourne University we, we were I think probably better people to draw with because we'd had mentored by um, uh, the, the art school at RMIT. On the other hand there were very good theoretical um, history people, planning people and so on and that was a more expansive thing in, at uh, Melbourne University. Mm. I yeah. thought it was a very enriched facility for, for two things and then subsequently I think in terms of about a decade on and was trying to get a job in London let's say, uh, I didn't feel that I was underdone. After graduation you travelled extensively, so first relocating to Sydney where you worked under Colin Madigan at Edwards, Madigan and Torzello. Yes. And then you departed for the UK and ultimately then on to America, yeah. quite the adventure. Yeah. And um, you ended up working under Paul Ru Rudolph. Yes. Can you tell me about that period in your life and how those people influenced your practice when you returned to Australia? Yeah. The major influence is that I came back from Sydney and married my wife Kay. Very important. And very important. And so she had been working with Channel 9 uh, in, in the... Um, in Melbourne tonight and so on. So we both got together, married and then went to London. And in London I found uh, Chamberlain, Powell and Bond and we worked there for two years, three years. Then we would take off in six, like at Easter and travel through Europe down to, down to Greece, Morocco, Spain, uh, just looking and, uh, and, and finding what, what architecture was about in, in European model. Uh, sometime later, uh, we went to America and then went to New York and uh, a New York architect um, found a job for me at Yale at, uh, with Paul Rudolph, who was the uh, senior uh, academic at uh, Yale. So that was good. And you've told some rich stories around your time with Paul. Yes. Uh, including living in his apartment when, when yes. he was not in town. Yes. How did he influence you as a, as a young architect? Well, I think he's, he's in, he was enthusiastic, he understood, and he was very disciplined. And so uh, in terms of um, producing uh, innovative work, uh, we would, uh, in the studio, draw and, and manufacture uh, the work that he led, led with us. You designed the Harold Holt Swimming Centre, yeah. an early representation of brutalist architecture in Melbourne, yes. in collaboration with one of your lecturers and mentors, Kevin Borland. Yes. Can you tell me about how this collaboration influenced you and also the outcome of the project? Yeah. Well, after m my time away, um, there was, uh, Kevin was, had an office next door to the office that I ultimately got to and we, we were very much enthused as a Kevin Borland was and uh, he was the leader and I was really the person that was his, his um, uh, I suppose, understudy and through that piece of work uh, we joined together. And was this at a time when you were sharing the same building in East Melbourne? Yes. The hotbed of young architecture practices? Yeah, there was a, four terrace houses in Parlett Street, East Melbourne. And so uh, we had a back office and Kevin had an upstairs office. And there were four, four people of, of, of architects. And it was a really good um, grouping because if you could swap people, if you had a big job, you could pull two or three people into the job. And so I had two people working with me and then mar married Kevin's two people. And so there were four. Mm. Mm. And this is before Evan Walker returned from Canada to join you in the practice. Yes. Yeah, Kevin and, uh, Evan and I were um, 
joined at RMIT at the first flag of 1954. And so we'd kept um, very good mates and he'd taken a journey to Canada and so uh, to deal with a master's class. So he'd come back in 64 and uh, so we had um, 10 years after we'd just <laughs> met each other and we, we took up a um, uh, the back room as well and so we were uh, joined the HIP, you say. For a long and fruitful partnership. Yeah, a good partnership. It's a 10, ten year partnership. And subsequently, he went into politics. From here, you go on to design the Canberra School of Music, Princess Hill High School, and various buildings at MLC. These are significant raw concrete buildings. Do you have a lasting love affair with Beton Brute? in the right place in the right time. And there was a Canberra School of Music, which is really one of the very significant buildings at the time. We also dealt with red brick in Melbourne. We were not doing it all at once. And Lauriston Girls School, and that was a very early school uh, for me to, to, to gain. And so uh, we went then to into educational um, work. Is it the earlier influences in your career that saw you bring in raw concrete as a strong material in your practice? Yes, it is. And, and it's, it's a form that you can see that the, uh, the pressure of, of building and not without manufacturing something slick or positive, it's a, mat it's a matrix of, of, of concrete. And so it, it tells you the story of the building. It's a beautiful way of putting it. So I'd like to talk more about some of your most significant projects in Melbourne. So let's start with the MCG. Within that precinct there is very good amenity in, in all the way around the, the ground and, and men and women and families are coming together and in the uh, northern stand uh, there are some very significant spaces in which people come in and escalate up and so it's, it's a sort of a, a really strong uh, exercise and I think people enjoy it. Was it daunting to work on a stadium which is so close to everybody's heart here in Victoria? <laughs> well I only live about 200 metres away so, so. So uh, I've got to get it right, and I think it has been uh, much appreciated. Very successful. You were telling the story about the, the uh, East Melbourne Residents Association up in arms around the lights going up. Yes. Um, and the fact that you were actually, you're an East Melbourne resident, yes. but also were responsible for some of the new design elements. Yes, it is. They, the, you can't hold um, elements of uh, real real circumstance that people have got to give way and and grow so the imagination of what has happened to the MCG was really in the 1930s wouldn't would never have seen anything like it uh, the next uh, circumstance was was I've just really finished the tennis um, center uh, practice courts uh, which Roger Federer has reported to have said they're very good. <laughs> we'll talk about Princess Hill High School and the work you've done there. Yes, the, the, it was burnt down in, uh, for half the school a long time before you were born. And so uh, the um, head wanted um, a new school uh, and we built it with half the, the money that was done. But I took his advice to place a theatre and a library in the centre of that school and it's, it's addressed that uh, streetscape and again North Carlton people, uh, my sister involved, uh, appreciate that as well. And so the community embraced the raw concrete nature of the, of the redevelopment? Well it's a bit hard for them to take it down. <laughs> The Olivia Newton-John wing at the hospital in Heidelberg, that's yes. of particular importance to you. 
Well, I think it's it's the the latest uh, and most significant um, health element in particular, and so uh, it's it's really bringing uh, the hospital alive. And in terms of its circumstance, it's it's really um, opened up with uh, Olivia's presence uh, a major, more social structure about the patients and their parents and so on. And, and I admire her and I admire that kind of thinking about hospitals. Um, and so I think there's a sort of a revolution a bit uh, and not miss, miss, missing the health aspect but the social aspect of health, mm -hmm. just as it's come through in schools, the social aspects of people living and breathing together and learning together is, is, very, is very significant. Mm -hmm. So the buildings that I try to make is really to make them attach people and think what they are getting and, and being comfortable within them. Mm. How you can impact their well-being. Yes and how they feel within a space. Yeah. The uh, county court. I wouldn't want to be <laughs> in the court, but the county court in uh, William Street, uh, was it William Street? It's, yes. Yeah, William Street, and there's some very good interiors in there, particularly for the, for the judges and the, the people that are, are going there, but you don't want to go there. <laughs> And what year was that project completed? It was, it was about, uh, about 10 years ago now. And going back a little, 120 Collins Street. It's a really significant... It's 25 years old. ...project for you. Yes. Can you talk more about that? Yes, it was um, designed to fit Collins Street and uh, Russell Street and, and set back from uh, the church uh, that that's on the corner and so there's a low rise uh, about that height uh, there and then the, uh, the biggest structure of 30 stories or so um, back on uh, Little Collins Street. And was that your first high-rise project in Melbourne? Yes, yeah. And that's going back 25 years so yes. there would have been challenges then I'm sure in terms of building technology and capability that you mm. pushed against. Yeah, so. And now you partnered with Grimshaw on yes. the recent Southern Cross redevelopment. Yes. Can you talk about that project? So in, in terms of the partnership with Grimshaw, they came with the, the station technologies and simply with this um, diesel coming in, uh, the undulation of the roof is really, uh, expelling uh, that and so it was really the curving uh, model that Grimshaw's and their engineers in Melbourne here and ourselves worked th thoroughly as, as a partnership here and so uh, it's really taking it to the streetscape and it, I, I see Spencer Street being upgraded and as I said I think it's really a, a transitional position from the Hoddle Grid, Spencer Street, and then going across the tracks, and then out into the uh, the Port Authority. I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a massive shift of ground in Melbourne. So, a common thread with the interview subjects for the Modern Melbourne Project, which this is part of, is a commitment to teaching and communication in design. So communicating the value of design, not only to students, but also to, to everyday people. Um, amongst many commitments, you taught architecture at RMIT, and you also wrote the regular housing column for The Age between 1966 and 69. Yes. Can you tell me why this is an, an important part of your practice? It was, <clears throat> it was really a way of um, exposing um, the things that I had learned and passed them on in, uh, as a professor. And uh, the small home service was following on from Robin Boyd and Neil Clarahan and Jack Clark. I was the fourth person to uh, spin the age on a Monday morning 
and so th that was really then following on um, in, in housing in particular. And do you think that we have lost our way somewhat with that type of communication? It doesn't, we do have obviously design columns and regular articles about the development of the city, but not necessarily uh, a column or um, a, you know, area within the newspaper or other publications focused purely on, on residential housing and, yes. and um, trying to communicate the importance of well-designed yes. residential housing. So do you think we've lost our way? Well, I think, I think, I think it's a, a difficult question to ask. Um, there are very good um, uh, people coming into the boulevards. I mean, if you think of St Kilda Road, first of all, they were an office of space. And then now there are changeover and people coming in with uh, the money to deal with that and then coming into the city. And the city really form comes with that and then going up to uh, the top end of Swanston Street where there are students uh, looking at uh, the, the RMIT and uh, Melbourne University. And I think that's all, all for the good. So it's a cosmopolitan city. It wasn't in the 1950s. It was a sort of uh, post-war circumstance. So it, it's changed its uh, coloration and its, its flavour I think is very significant. So you've had a rich and rewarding career which we've only just touched on in this interview um, but it resulted in you being made an officer of the Order of Australia for your contribution to architecture. So if not this, what are you most proud of in your career? Oh, I'd, be, I'd be out of turn if, if I said some, some one thing. Uh, so there are a number of things uh, in terms of, of buildings that uh, I've been fortunate enough to, to put forward in terms of the Australian circumstance. There are a hearty number of projects in Canberra um, and laboratories in Queensland University. And so I think the package is really uh, significant in Sydney uh, for its School of Music as well. Well, we were chatting before about if you knew how many projects you'd worked on over the life of your career. Yeah. And so we could only imagine that it's in the thousands. Yes, uh, so I'm not that. <laughs> so I guess the idea of just the breadth of experience and projects yeah. would, be the, would be the thing that you would yeah. be most proud of. Yeah. Well, I've done work in China and I've done work in Hanoi for an international school and the um, embassy for uh, Saudi Arabia uh, for the Australian embassy. So I think that's a very difficult project and, and they, they all have their goods and bads. So I've had a good, good run, I think. And one that still continues. We hope so. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Daryl. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.